Hi, I'm Bert Klaus, a product manager in the database group here at Oracle. And today I'd like to talk about an important aspect of delivering database as a service, and that's to have a good service catalog. So we'll look at a little bit of the benefits overview of catalogs, uh, talk about their structure and how they come into play, the workflow that applies to them. And then we've developed standardized service levels for some of the aspects of delivering Oracle database services that we'll present, and then a quick summary. So one thing to get clear at the beginning here, and a lot of confusion can result if we don't have this in mind right away, there's really two audiences here. One is the consumer of the services. They need to know what their options are, how much they cost, what they can expect from those services. And then the provider who's going to give those services in some sort of format, present them to those consumers, and then try to provide them as efficiently and effectively as possible. Now today's conversation will, will really focus on the providers, and then the consumers will see one small piece of this at the end of the day. So the provider is very interested in presenting very concise, clear service offerings to the consumers. So the Discussion here will be focused on what will those offerings look like, and then a little bit about how do I provide them in an Oracle environment. So as the provider, what I want to end up with is behind those services, which the consumers from choose from, I want very predictable and repeatable deployment methods so that I can deliver those services consistently, and then I want to be able to deploy them in several different deployment options so I can pick and choose the best way to provide those to my consumers without the consumer having to worry about those technical details. So what are some of the real benefits that accrue from all of this? Well, it's a great way to enforce and create standardization, and we'll talk in a moment about why that's so important. These clear and consistent descriptions of services will be available for both the consumers and the providers to see so they can agree on what these services are. There's no surprises or disappointments about how they work. We talked about the repeatable deployments. That's going to be implemented in that technical aspect of things. This is going to help identify costs. Consumers will know what things cost, what they're paying for, and what they're getting. And the provider can help understand what it costs to deliver these services. Then one aspect of this that a lot of customers are interested in is the self-service aspect. We might enable some of the services for consumers to deploy and manage on their own. And what we're really headed to for these providers is they have to transform themselves into a service provider mentality. So as a private enterprise, an IT group, you're competing with companies that have public cloud services. And in this private context, you need to compete with them both on service offerings, uh, quality, and of course, cost. So I talked about standardization. So when we help customers and enterprises move from their traditional siloed environments to more of a database as a service or a cloud type of environment, the first step in this journey, in this transformation, is to standardize the environment. And so by doing so, you enable uh, cost savings down the line. In fact, a lot of customers, as soon as they've standardized, they find it very easy to consolidate. And for many enterprises, that's where they are today in their journey to a cloud environment. But again, the key to that is good standardization. And again, the service catalog is the key vehicle for enforcing and enabling that standardization. So quick overview of the catalog itself. So we mentioned there's consumers and there's providers. So the consumer can see the business catalog. This is a very simple, concise menu of the service offerings, what do they cost. It's vendor agnostic. It doesn't explain how these services de are delivered. It just explains what they are and how they behave. Some of those services might be exposed in a self-service catalog, although not all of them. Uh, that would be up to the provider to decide which services lend themselves to a self-service model and which the provider would like more control over once the request is made. And then behind the scenes, the provider has a technical catalog that explains in detail how every service option is deployed and managed and maintained. Now you'll see off to the side there, there's also exceptions. Uh, we've seen some cases where a customer will try to design a catalog that will handle every possible permutation that may come up. Uh, that, of course, gets very complicated. And so it's important to identify some exception triggers that would say, well, these services don't quite fit into our standard offerings. No problem, we know how to handle them. It takes a little extra time to do so. There might be some extra cost, but 
consumers won't be driven away from the catalog because they don't see exactly what they might need in a special situation. So what about the structure behind all this and some of the workflow that's involved here? So some of the key terms. So we have different service tiers, and these will be the basic offerings that consumers will see. And then within those, we'll have different service levels for different aspects of the service, such as availability or security. Then there's a provisioning flow. So when a consumer is interested in obtaining one of those services, how do they do it? What sort of options or choices or decisions will they need to make? And then for the provider, after all of that is done, there's going to be a deployment model that comes into play that says, where do I deploy this service? How do I manage it? Uh, all of those details. And of course, again, typically that's hidden from the consumer, except in some of the special cases that we referred to. So to get this effort started, uh, what I did was go through quite a few different customer examples of service catalogs that they had employed uh, to see how they were addressing this topic. And so I've made a summary here that shows how these 10 different customers have addressed this. And a few things are very consistent. Uh, everybody uses availability as an entry point to describe their services. Uh, most people will allow consumers to choose their capacity. And then you see often they have a choices about security, uh, the different workload, typically the support that applies to the services described in some detail. And then for customers that are implementing a chargeback or a showback model, cost will be shown. And then the, for the number of services that a given provider will show to their internal customers, uh, typically it's from three to five, and some a little bit more, some a little bit less, but pretty consistently in the, in the range of about four services to keep things simple. So when we took those definitions and we've adapted these to, to our recommendations, we've come up with four service levels. So for availability, security, performance, and agility, we recommend that you use those as the ways to describe your database services. And then for each of those attributes, you would explain for a given service, what do you expect? What's the service level agreement, if you will, that would apply to that, that aspect of the service? And then there'll be additional ways to describe the service in terms of, for example, the workload that it will run, uh, what kind of support terms are available, is it 24 by 7, is it email only, that type of thing. And then, of course, uh, the other capabilities, we might have specialized capabilities for some services if they're for specific types of workloads or applications. And, of course, the cost of the service is typically very interesting also. Okay, let's look in detail how these break down. So we're going to have two views here, right? We have the business catalog for the consumers and then the technical catalog for IT. And we'll present the consumers in this example with four service tiers. Uh, very common to use metals to describe those, and that's what we'll do in our standardized offerings. And then we've got these differentiated in terms. You can see the dollar signs indicating different cost levels for the different service offerings and then different levels of support, right? We'd start off with just email for a bronze service and then extended hours uh, by live support telephone as you move up the scale to the platinum service tier. Now within each of those service offerings, we talked about the different levels, right? So for availability, security, agility, and performance, we'll explain <clears throat> for each of those services exactly what do you get. And so that you can see, for example, uh, the availability level increases uh, in correlation to each service tier itself, but security by default in each case is going to be bronze. Now we can go even deeper. So for example, within a attribute such as availability, there's different types of events which can impact availability. And then we can describe in detail uh, exactly what the impact is for different types of availability events. Now, a provider may or may not choose to expose that level of detail to their consumers in the business catalog, but the provider will have to understand exactly how each service does behave uh, during each of those types of events. Now, other levels, uh, such as security,
By default, we would have a bronze level for each of these because the uh, security level that applies to a given service is typically orthogonal to other attributes. Uh, we might have information that needs to be available uh, all of the time but is not very uh, secure, not very sensitive. And conversely, we might have very sensitive data that's only necessary to be available uh, during limited work hours, for example. So what we often have, and we see several customers do this for security specifically, uh, we'll have sub-levels available. We'll have these different levels available as options uh, during provisioning time. So then if we start to shift over to the viewpoint of the uh, technical aspect, so the provider for a given service, such as a gold service, they will understand for delivering those specified levels of availability, security, agility, and performance, what exactly, what's the bill of materials for delivering each of those levels, right? So that will be all detailed in the technical catalog. And then when the provider wants to know specifically how to deploy their service in any of their uh, deployment models that they may choose to deploy to, to support for a gold service in this case, then we can look at the details for exactly how to support that service, let's say in a multi-tenant environment. So we'll have an aggregated bomb that pulls together the essential elements that are relevant to the multi-tenant environment, and then the specific configuration details, the processes and best practices that apply to that multi-tenant deployment model for gold services. And those details then, of course, may vary as we look at the different deployment models that we could deploy a gold service in. Of course, multi-tenant would be our default option because we'd have several advantages of, as a provider there that we could take advantage of to provide those services at the least cost and the easiest management. So what about the provisioning? So when a consumer is interested in selecting their service and provisioning it, we've seen three main approaches. One is a very standard approach with minimal choices. So in this case, the consumer comes in, they pick their service tier, they choose their capacity, and they're done. They have no other options, no other choices apply, a very simple, standardized approach. Many customers, uh, about half, so far about half did the first method, about half have done the other method. They'll have a similar approach, but it will have some customization choices at some point during the workflow. So they'll pick a service tier, a service offering, choose capacity, and then they may have options to change things such as the security level or special capabilities before the service is provisioned. And then a few customers will take a very customized approach and they'll allow selections all along the pathway of the provisioning process for their consumers. So I mentioned exceptions a little bit earlier. Uh, there's really two types of exceptions. Some of them are fairly fine-grained and they would happen at provisioning time. So there would be some kind of default for services that the consumer would choose to override, uh, such as a detail, perhaps the version of the database, which typically would not be something exposed to the consumer, but there could be cases where they have an application that they need to choose a specific database version for, and then we might allow that as an override during provisioning, or some sort of minor customization during the provisioning. Now the type of exception that we talked about earlier really applies more to the second one, which is the consumer is interested in a service that really falls outside of the scope of the current business catalog. Typically, this means that we'd have a custom design, probably deploy it in a, a siloed, sort of encapsulated environment so it could be managed separately. So now we'd like to talk about what we've defined at Oracle to help define services in a standardized approach. So we worked across several product management teams to develop these standardized levels, which we're going to present here in our business catalog first. This would be the consumer view of these standard services. We have four different service levels, and you can see the suggested uh, use cases for each of these. And then when we look deeper into these, we would see that we have the different service levels for each of them described. We've used availability as the entry point for each of these. So a bronze service is bronze availability, gold is gold, and so on. Then by default, we would propose that each of these would be delivered at a bronze security level because you might have a 
a workload with very high availability needs but low security needs, and of course vice versa. You could have some low availability needs but a very high security requirement for a given service. So we'll propose that those can be changed during provisioning time so the consumer would select the appropriate security level. By default, we'd say that changing your agility for a service, so for example changing the service level of the service or changing the size of the service would be done by consumer request, although we do have options and technologies to make that more of a scheduled or an automated process. Uh, performance are two lower uh, services. We'd say with no KPIs, we're saying that uh, typically those would be deployed with hopefully sufficient resources so that they run appropriately. And if the consumer notices something wrong, uh, then they might work with the provider to correct that. And then the two higher service offerings would have managed, or sorry, monitored performance so that the provider can give feedback to the consumer if the provider notices that maybe things aren't working quite the way they need to. Now we don't go into detail uh, to give specific uh, cost or support definitions for these services. So when you're deploying these at your enterprise, we assume that you would provide uh, uh, appropriate support and cost for these sort of graduated uh, based on the service tier itself. So if we look within these services, uh, we're going to look at some of the levels now. So availability for each of these services is defined as the following. And so again, there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the service offering and the availability level it delivers. And then we describe these in terms of uh, behavior during certain types of availability events. And for security, again, everyone's bronze by default, uh, but these are the four levels that are available for consumers to choose from to address specific types of uh, either internal policies or regulatory compliance, or we have what we call the maximum security architecture at the highest level, which would address even the most stringent internal corporate policies for their most important information. For agility, there's really two aspects to this. Uh, there's an aspect that's visible to consumers. So they want to know, how can I change my service? And we said these would all be by request, by default. Although there are ways to schedule changes to services or even have those happen automatically on demand. And then from a provider perspective, agility also includes mobility. So a consumer doesn't know or care where their service is running. But a provider may choose to locate a service in a specific area to save money, provide better performance to the consumer, or load balancing. Uh, there'd be a lot of considerations where a provider could be interested in uh, enabling mobility, although again, the consumer wouldn't necessarily know that that was happening at all. Now, per performance, uh, the customer, the, cons the provider will decide how consumers will choose to specify their performance needs. Typically today we see this done in terms of choosing capacity, CPU and RAM. So typically in the catalog, in the business catalog, we'll have different options for that, maybe in a small, medium, or large database format. Uh, storage size is typically chosen orthogonally. Uh, we might have a high performance requirement that doesn't need a lot of storage and, and vice versa. Right? The other aspect of uh, performance will be the physical infrastructure supporting it, uh, the CPU speed and the type of storage itself. And then for the provider, we'll be deciding what sort of management could apply. And we're saying by default, uh, we would have our two lower levels with no KPIs. So it's up to the consumer to kind of monitor and keep track of how things are working. But for more important services, the provider would be monitoring their behavior and alerting consumers if they see a problem that needs to be addressed. So for support, uh, again, we don't provide specific guidance on the levels we would recommend. However, we do recommend that when you're defining your support terms, you make sure to tell your consumers uh, what, what are the hours of support, when is coverage, what kind of response time, resolution time can they respect expect? Uh, what sort of format is it in? Is it a FAQ? Is it an online forum? Obviously the more important services will probably have live support, typically 24 by 7. And then another very important aspect is maintenance windows. So consumers need to understand how often, how frequently, and to what, what impact they'll have from maintenance events. And this becomes very important in consolidated environments when we want to be able to as a provider to collect services together that can withstand the same sort of maintenance windows.
And then for cost, uh, today we see most of our enterprise customers uh, monitoring this, maybe doing some showback internally. We don't see a lot of uh, private enterprises doing a full chargeback sort of model, but we do see several choices. Where they might be making a fixed charge or a fixed showback or just based on usage or some sort of mixed model. And then typically this will be based to some extent um, if they're using this on how much CPU, how much RAM is used. And then it, it's also important that if the consumer chooses to get uh, special capabilities or um, special support that we charge extra for those. And I'd say today the people that are doing this are typically focused on a fixed charging model. It's the most obviously predictable. It's very easy to understand both for the consumer and the provider. Uh, the costs are very easy to, to decipher and there's no worry about over usage or under usage or any of those complications. Okay, let's look into some of our technical details that are supporting those service levels that we looked at. And so again, if you as an enterprise wish to adopt these levels directly and present that business catalog we looked at to your consumers, now we'll show you exactly how to implement those at your company. So for availability, before we look at some of the technical details, um, again, there's different aspects to availability that we saw earlier. So many consumers and, of course, all providers will want to know exactly what the behavior is for each of these services for all of these attributes of availability. Um, some customers are more concerned about some of these events than others. So we've gone through in detail to explain for each of these standardized levels exactly how do they behave in these different circumstances. So we can talk about these uh, in terms of, you know, sort of a, a quant qualitative discussion or we can get into more details for each of these in terms of their impact to specific applications, to what's the impact on my application for each of these types of events. We can also look at uh, metrics, so a uh, quantitative approach will explain the RTO and RPO for each of our levels in these different circumstances. And again, you might choose to present these details in your business catalog to consumers or possibly not, right? It would depend on how sophisticated and concerned those consumers are about specific availability outage classes. Now, when we come to implement these, our first level is bronze availability. It's a very uh, simple deployment. Uh, we have uh, restart on the same service, on the same server. Uh, we're gonna back up our services off-site, either to the tape or the cloud. And again, these are for uh, services that have fairly low availability requirements. For silver, the main change that we're going to make is we're going to provide clustering as an option so that we have better uh, performance, uh, less of an impact for any sort of local outage that would affect a, a one of the nodes or one of the database instances in the cluster. And of course, that also has some advantages for maintenance, will be less impactful to the services that are deployed with silver availability. When we move to gold, this is where we introduce replication to a secondary site. So we have a primary site, and then we'll have either synchronous or asynchronous database replication to a second site. So in the event that that initial, the primary site goes offline, uh, we have a fully functional secondary site to host those services. And of course, this also has advantages for um, maintenance activities also, because we can migrate services to that second site during maintenance of the primary site. And then finally, our platinum level of availability is really the showcase for Oracle Database 12C features. Uh, the goal here is to mask all sorts of uh, impact to any applications that are platinum ready, that are able to take advantage of features such as application continuity. So in this environment, uh, our goal is to have a zero downtime application environment uh, during any planned or unplanned availability event. So for security levels, we've made the same sort of detailed uh, definitions here. And so starting with bronze, which will apply to non-sensitive and data that has been masked. So that masked data might have come from a production environment, but now it's been masked. So there's nothing sensitive within it that could be compromised. Uh, this is a very basic level for availability. Uh, 
Uh, so we're really focused on capabilities of the operating system, the operating environment, and some of the database features itself to keep things secure because we have, again, you know, many good capabilities built in there at that level which will meet these requirements for a bronze security level. Silver, for corporate internal uh, need-to-know type of data, brings to bear several more capabilities. And so this is where we're interested in encrypting data, both in flight and at rest. And we will also be masking any of this data if we need to move it to a, a test or development environment. As we move up the ladder to gold security, this is where we will be deploying services that need to meet regulatory compliance, such as PCI, DSS, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, here we need to bring more controls to bear, both in terms of uh, database fault, the privilege analysis activities, and also make sure that privileged users uh, can only do the operations that they're allowed to do, nothing extra. And we'll also deploy Oracle Key Vault here to manage all of the different uh, encryption keys that would apply across this environment. And then for platinum, uh, this would be for our most important data. And this is where we'll bring uh, pretty much the entire portfolio of Oracle security products to bear on this one. Because we want to make sure that uh, no stone is left unturned in terms of what we can uh, prevent people from doing, either accidentally or maliciously. And if something does occur, we want to be able to detect that immediately, alert to its occurrence, and then have full logs so that we can trace back anything that does happen that we wish hadn't happened. So let's talk about some of our key lessons learned from all of this. Um, it can look very complicated, and we have uh, encountered some examples of very complicated service catalogs that haven't been very successful. So the key is to keep it very simple. Uh, the consumer view, that business catalog part of things, uh, should be very straightforward, very easy to understand for the consumers. All of the details of deployment details, uh, maintenance details, products, vendor specific things, that'll all be in the technical catalog for IT to use. And as this is presented to your consumers, it's important to have a plan for their buy-in and adoption. Uh, for example, some customers have promised their consumers if they use their service catalog standardized offerings, that the costs of those services will decrease over time or they can promise uh, faster deployments, uh, more repeatable deployments. That type of thing will help attract consumers to this model. Uh, you should have a process to identify and handle exceptions. That's very important so that things don't fall outside of the scope of the business catalog. As the provider, you should be working to minimize the distinct environments that you're supporting. So it's important to offer those services that consumers need, but then make sure that you support those with the least amount of different options and uh, deployment permutations that you need to. That'll keep your environment simpler and easier to manage. We think you should start small. Uh, it's easier to add more services over time than to remove them. Uh, you might have a service that only a few people use, then if you decide it's too expensive to support it, obviously it's difficult to convince them that, well, sorry, we didn't mean to put it there, so it's easier to add some services over time, incrementally. And as you create this plan, uh, stay with it. Um, you'd like to get people to move into it over time. Uh, you need to be willing to adjust a little bit over time, but the key is to create a very standard environment that people will get comfortable with and start to deploy all of their services in. And to do that, you need to present it in the form of a service provider model. And it's also important, this is the provider's opportunity to show their internal customers how they can differentiate their services. So instead of internal IT looking to a public cloud to deploy services, internal IT can show how their services offer more tailored to the business, uh, costed appropriately and uh, competitively, and make it the best possible environment for their consumers. Uh, we have a white paper on our OTN site that goes into a lot more detail about the customer examples and also the technical details for availability and security levels we talked about. Uh, we have a blog that talks about developments in this area along with other topics for the private database cloud group. And of course, if you have the chance to attend Open World, uh, we'll be doing a speaking session on the topic there.
and we have three different booths in the private, uh, in, the, in the database area that we'll be talking about this and other aspects of private database cloud and database as a service. Okay, everyone, thanks for watching. Uh, hope this was useful for you, and please follow up with our additional resources for anything that might help you further. Hope to see you in the cloud. <laughs>